Today, that is, if you can lift it at your local Zarbo Audio Emporium. Welcome back to the Zarbo Audio Project's Memorial Stadium. Recapping our Bluetooth speaker build off battle so far, in round one, the Pro Tools build took a decisive early lead. But in round two, the Basic Tools build battled back for the win to tie up the match all even one to one. Round three was close. So close, in fact, that the judges scored the contestants even and called it a draw. With two more rounds to go, it's literally anyone's match. Will the odds leading Pro Tools Build Speaker take the win, or will the hometown favorite Basic Tools Build Speaker be able to battle through the pain to win the day? Contestants, go to your corners. At the sound of the Bluetooth connection tune, I want you to come out fighting. Well, getting right back into it. If you remember, we had just rounded over the edges a bit and were almost ready to prime the cabinets. But there are a few little areas that need to be filled in before we do that. Areas like this one, that, these. Alright, there are a lot of little places that need touching up really, but that's why they sell wood filling products. If you look at the wood filler aisle in the hardware store, you'll realize that there are a lot of products to do this with. For the basic build, we'll use the Durham's, which cost just a few bucks. And for the pro build, we'll be using the Bondo, which runs around $15 or so. So, sort of a trick here uh, is to know how much hardener to put. Now, this is a quart can. This uh, three quarters of an ounce, or 21 grams of hardener, should be enough to mix this whole can up. But <laughs> you're kind of left guessing. So, after you do it a few times, you sort of know by eye. But I'm, this is blue. I'm used to the hardener making everything red, so this is actually throwing me off a little bit. So I'm just going to put in what I think it needs. This is a little trickier than the Durham's putty too, because to be honest with you, if you put too much hard on it and on this, it's going to just set up really fast and get hot and, and start curing everything really quick. So um, you don't want to put too much hard on it, but if you don't put enough, it never solidifies. It relies on a, a chemical reaction to set up. I don't like the smell of this. I hope this goes away by the time my wife gets home, I'm going to be in trouble. So I'm not trying to flood the surface. I'm just going to try to get it on all the seams. A little bit, not even, not even a whole lot. doesn't need a lot. I'll put some on the flat parts too, just to fill in the grain. Put it in real thin. This stuff does not mind being applied thin. It's kind of what it's designed for. The derms, I'd say that's more for scratches, digs, gouges, but you don't want to necessarily apply that super duper thin. So after just a few minutes of filling in the cracks and large grain lines, this is what it looks like. Bondo cures really hard, so I was careful not to put any more than I needed to do the job because I know what goes on must be sanded off. As I said, for the basic build, we'll be using Durham's Rock Hard Water Putty. It's pretty cool stuff actually. In the can, it's not putty at all, it's just a powder. You pour some out and add water and mix it, which turns it into a nice putty that fills smaller holes and gouges really well. You want it to have a firm consistency but still be spreadable. The cool thing about Durham's is, if you've got your mix a bit too runny, just add some more powder to firm it up to where it needs to be. Durham's is only for filling in smaller areas, however. It even says so on the can, don't fill in large thin areas. Even though I did get it on a larger area, it will almost all be sanded off except for the little holes and tear outs, which should be just fine. Well, it's been about 15 minutes or so, and the uh, enclosure that has the bondo on it is hard enough to uh, start sanding. If I wait too much longer, it's going to be pretty hard to get it off. I'm going to have to use a lot of force and a lot of pressure. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and sand the Bondo version. The Durham's Rock Hard Water Putty version is still quite soft. That's going to need several, an hour or two before I can sand that. 
<laughs> this is ready now, so let me go ahead and have that before it gets too hard and I have to work too hard. Right, here's what the Pro build with the Bondo looks like. See, there isn't much left. Uh, it just gets into the little grain holes and scratch, gouge marks, stuff like that. Fills it in a little bit on the side where the grain was pretty rough. And uh, you sand it smooth and you got a really smooth finish. So when you apply your primer, you're gonna have a good paint job afterwards. Well, it's been a few hours, a couple of hours. I've let this uh, enclosure with the Durham's Rock Hard Water Putty set out in my hot garage to hopefully speed up the curing process a little bit. Yep, more sanding. But you know, it's really important to get this step right because, oh, wait a minute. Ooh, I think he's gonna speak. Yeah, that, that came out pretty good. I guess there were just a few areas on the back where it was maybe a bit thicker than it should have been. And that just kind of glumped up. But um, I'm gonna have to do that again, let it set, and then sand it down again. Yeah, don't worry, we'll just skip that part. How's about we put some primer on these babies? I'm using Bin Shellac Base Primer here. It's easy to apply, builds thickness quickly, and dries really fast. While that's drying, let me glue the bases together so I can get them primed as well. Measure, glue, and screw. Done. There are always a few little imperfections that you can't see until you prime your enclosure. For those, they make glazing and spot putty, often sold at the auto parts store. It's perfect for filling in little holes like these. I use a similar procedure as with the wood filler, except this stuff just squeezes right out of the tube. No mixing necessary. Just fill and let dry, sand, and reprime. So, who took the cabinet prep and prime round? I tell you it was close, but due to the short wait time and overall better quality of the Bondo wood filler, the Pro Tools build takes round four. Now it's time to glue in the speaker drivers. I've tested each speaker to make sure that they work correctly because once they're glued in, taking them out for any reason really isn't an option. A few spots of super glue here and there will be plenty to hold these in place until we get some black sealant in the gap. You may have been wondering during the sanding stage why I didn't get the driver opening sanded perfectly straight. The reason is, I needed there to be a gap so I could shoot in some black silicone sealant to seal the driver airtight. The super glue really is just there to hold it in place until I can get the sealant in place. So the process is, place the driver in the opening, just a touch recessed, put a few spots of super glue here and there, then hold it for a few seconds until it sets. Installing the VU meter was a little tricky because I was just using my fingers. A stick of wood with a loop of tape on the end would probably work well. I just pushed it in place and hit it with a few drops of super glue here and there. Don't go crazy with the super glue though or you may end up gluing your fingers to your enclosure. This only happened to me all three times that I was installing these though so it's probably not very likely. I taped off the VU meters before gooping in the speaker drivers. That stuff's fairly messy and I didn't want it to get on the LED light bars. I just put a piece of tape on the front of the LEDs and then trimmed the excess with a razor blade, peeling off the excess. Now we're ready to use our black silicone gasket maker to seal the speakers in airtight. It's the same procedure for both the basic and pro builds, as is much of what I'm showing you here. The stuff I got comes with a nozzle to create a smaller bead as it exits the tip, but that nozzle means you have to squeeze harder to get the silicone out. We're basically just trying to force the silicone into the gap between the cabinet and the speaker frame. Once it looks like you have enough material in there to seal the driver properly, wipe off the excess and give it about a full day to cure. While we have the black silicone out, let's seal up the speaker wires that go through the inner partitions to the middle amplifier section. Apply it from both sides, just to be sure that it's sealed up tight. The vents need to be glued in now. These increase the base output of the speaker and they need to be airtight. The openings needed to be resanded just a bit to remove some primer. Then, once both vents were fitting appropriately snug, I pushed them in at the same time with a piece of wood. 
These are actually just smoothie straws, but they are the correct inner diameter, so even though they are very thin, they will work fine. A bit of super glue to seal them in, and we're in business. I'm cutting an appropriately sized piece of tape to cover the speaker drivers with because it's almost time for the next step. Paint! I chose to paint these cabinets with a two-step process. First, I painted the cabinets with a texture paint to give the cabinets some, you know, texture. Then I hit it with a satin black paint because I didn't want these to be super glossy. I did the same for the bases as well. Follow the manufacturer's instructions if you want this step to turn out right. I gave everything a good couple of days to fully dry before moving on to the next step, final assembly. So I need to take a minute here to bring you up to speed. Both the speakers and the VU meter were ready to install for this video, but I had previously created a few videos which outline how I got this far. I'll set up links in the description below for those, but basically I had to assemble the VU meter as well as cut up the speaker modules to prepare for use with this project. So in preparation for all the soldering that will take place shortly, let me introduce you to the Pro Tools and basic soldering irons. And then we can finally start installing all the various doodads into the cabinets. It's a little crowded in here, but this is my fancy schmancy uh, temperature control feedback uh, ceramic element soldering iron here, separate base unit. And this here, you dial in the temperature you want and it stays there. This here, this is, that's what it is, it's 30 watts and it's on full blast and that's what you get. So this, basic tools versus this, Pro Tools. I already assembled the Pro Tools VU meter in this here previous video, but just to prove to you that the basic tool soldering iron can do that job too, here is some footage of that. Soldering the LED board pins, Soldering on the connector and testing it out. Looks like it works. I wanted to put some small round felt pads on the bottom corners of the bases. This will protect the paint on those bottom corners from chipping as you move it around. I soldered a few long leads to the power on off switch. That third line is to borrow ground to power the LED in the switch and we'll install the switch first as it's the least accessible item. It's a push fit switch, no nut to thread on. And there, it's in, nice and snug. Next up, soldering leads to the DC input jack. That's the easy part, installing it is a little harder. As you know, I like to use a straight screwdriver to spin the nut on. First, I slide the nut over the wires and down to the switch. It's a little tight in there, but let me see if I can get you a peek at what I'm doing. There, it's starting to grab some threads. And that's snug enough soldering up the speaker leads to the amplifier. Now we're finally ready to solder up all the connections. Don't worry, there's no way I'm going to have you watch me solder various color wires together for the next 10 minutes. Although I did film the entire process for all three boxes, I think it's better if I just explain it to you in a diagram. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, there are a lot of wires coming out of that center section, and it can be confusing, but if we take it one step at a time, wiring this radio up is definitely doable. Here are all the pieces laid out clearly. First off, when you solder your wires to each individual component as I showed previously, make sure to use enough wire to reach outside the bottom of the enclosure with some extra to spare. You can always cut a little wire off if you find you don't need it, but if it's a few inches too short, it's really a pain to work on things. Trust me, it just gets frustrating. 
I'd recommend using 20 or 22 gauge wire and heat shrink tubing if you have it. If not, a few good wraps of electrical tape will work as well. So first of all, let's get the speakers ready. Each speaker is really two speakers, as I discussed in a previous video. Check that video out for a better explanation on this. But for now, this is how I wired up each speaker. Doing it this way presents a 12 ohm load to each side of the amplifier, which is really the safest way to do this. All the speakers I received had plenty of wire on the built-in lead, so you probably won't have to add any. You basically take a positive lead from one side and a negative lead from the other side. Those will be your two terminals that you connect to the amplifier. Then you just join the other two leads together. Test with a battery to confirm that both voice coils move in and out the same and to confirm polarity. Now let's wire up all the components in the box. The first thing we'll solder together is the switch and DC input positive leads. The red 12 volt positive lead from the DC input jack gets soldered to the red input lead on the switch. That brings 12 volt positive power to the switch. Now when we turn on the switch, the power comes out of the switch's blue line to the amplifier and VU meter. Next, we need to connect the black 12 volt negative leads to complete their respective circuits. Solder the black 12 volt negative leads from the amplifier, VU meter, and switch mounted LED to the DC input jack's black 12 volt negative lead. Now we need to get the signal from the Bluetooth daughter board on the amplifier to the VU meter. I covered that in my other video as well, but here's what that looks like real quick. So now we'll solder the yellow and white leads from the amplifier's Bluetooth daughter board to the VU meter. Now all we have to do is connect the speakers. Solder the positive and negative leads from the left speaker and right speaker to the amplifier and we should be in business. Now I have to say that the amplifier I received had the speaker's outputs marked incorrectly on the board. The diagram I'm showing you here is correct for my amplifier. If you get a similar unit from another seller, it may be different. I just wanted to warn you. My advice is to get one speaker soldered up and just twist the leads together on the other speaker, making sure that they don't touch. Then power it up and listen to some music. If it sounds hollow or just weird, then cover up one speaker with your hand. If it sounds quite a bit better that way, then you need to reverse the speaker leads on that speaker that you didn't solder yet because it was out of phase with the other speaker. Basically, one speaker was canceling the other out. That's why it sounds weird. Oh, I have one more thing to say regarding wiring this project up. Done. So once I got the amp installed and tested to see that everything was working correctly, I was ready to close this cabinet up. I filled each speaker cavity with a small wad of pillow stuffing. You can get it at the craft store, most Walmarts and Parts Express sells it too. Or if you have an old pillow that you need to toss out anyway, just steal a little stuffing from that one. I used a grapefruit or softball sized amount, which I split in two and loosely stuffed into each speaker cavity. That just cuts down on the echoes bouncing around inside the cabinet and making their way through the speaker cone. To secure the base to the cabinet, I just used a little of the same black silicone sealant that we used to seal up the speaker drivers. I didn't even use any screws, but if your base to cabinet fit is kind of loose, I would recommend at least one or two screws through the bottom of the cabinet into the base. I should have run a bead where the interior divider panels contact the base, but I forgot. I had to do that afterwards. Well, it looks like this project is finally finished. To recap, the Pro Tools build took round one, the Basic Tools build came back to take round two, and round three was judged to draw. Then the Pro Tools build came back to take round four in part two. And now it's time to reveal who took round 5 and who was the overall winner of the Bluetooth Speaker Build-Off Challenge. For that, let's head back to the Zarva Audio Projects Memorial Stadium to get the final decision from our ringside announcer. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. It's been a hard fought match. Both contestants have battled through their strengths and weaknesses to deliver the best product they could. So which contestant won the pivotal round 5? Even though the basic tool soldering iron cost only 10% of the pro tool soldering iron, it was still able to do the job just as well. Done. Ladies and gentlemen, round five has been ruled a draw. Leaving the final score two to one in favor of the pro tools build. 
The winner of the Bluetooth Speaker Build-Off Challenge is... The Bluetooth Build Bluetooth Speaker! <laughs> yeah, I had a bit of fun with that. I thought it might make things a little bit more interesting if I turned it into a contest. But truthfully, both speakers really came out good. They both function and even look the same. And without labeling them, I wouldn't be able to tell which was which. The Pro Tools or the Basic Tools Build. That said, there were some challenges that the Basic Tools speaker posed for me. Especially since I'm used to using all these highfalutin tools that I've amassed over the years. I didn't really love cutting out the panels with the jigsaw. It took a bit of work getting each panel the same width so that the box went together tight. And even though I was able to sand them mostly to the correct size, I really missed my table saw in that step. That thing just does a perfect job every time. But mostly though, the biggest issue I had was with the speaker drivers. Now don't get me wrong, I like how they sound, and the price is definitely right, but I just struggled to get them mounted in a way that I was happy with. If I had only one radio to make, I may have looked at it differently, as you might if you decide to build one. But I had four that I constructed, and I really missed being able to just cut out a hole and mount a speaker with a flange on it into the opening. If you had a 3D printer and could print out some flanges for these drivers, that would take about 90% of the frustration out of working on the project. Of course, someone with basic tools doesn't probably have a 3D printer, I imagine. So, I really tried to make this contest as fair and realistic as I could. I imagine that there are some things that I did that you may disagree with, and that's fine. The comments are open. But one thing I won't budge on is the fact that it's definitely more fun doing it yourself. So if you're on the fence about building your own Bluetooth radio, give it a shot. You never know what you can do till you try. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. What?